Welcome to London First Church of the Nazarene. We are a missional church located right in the center of London, Ontario. With over 400,000 residents in our city, we serve as an outlet for people like you to experience Jesus in a fresh new way. Join us today for a time of worship and inspiration as we come together to hear the heart of God. A pleasant good morning on this first Sunday in August. It's a joy to greet you from the London First Church of the Nazarene here in London, Ontario, Canada. I am Reverend Junior Susano, the lead pastor here at our church. We greet all our family and friends around the globe as well as we have come today to worship God on this beautiful summer day, this first Sunday in August. It's a holiday weekend here in, in Canada. But we are thankful for God's goodness, for His grace and mercies, for keeping us. Today we have a truly a wonderful service that we want to share with you today as we will be led in worship by Reverend Mauricio Rivera and his team as they will lead us and uh, that will be a blessing. And we pray that God will bless you as they share in Spanish and in English, of course. And then also a wonderful you know, instrumental special by Roy and Karen Atkins. A favorite song of ours, I know that will bless your heart. So we know that God has in, uh, really a blessing for each and every one of us today. And as you share with us, may you receive what God is saying, what the Spirit is saying to the churches, to the people, to the community, what God's Spirit is saying through us to you today. So let's begin with a word of prayer at this time. Our Father and our God, we thank you for this beautiful day. For every day that you give to us is a gift. It's precious. Every day, Father, reminds us that life is something that we should not take for granted. We realize that there are those who are not able to see this day. But Lord, we are so thankful that we have this opportunity. And as we are gathered here to worship you today, and as we gather around the world, we pray, God, that your Holy Spirit will minister to each and every heart on this Lord's Day. For we always declare that this is Sunday. This is Victory Day. This is Celebration Day. This is the day that you have made, and we are here to rejoice and be glad in it. So, Father, we pray that your Holy Spirit will fall fresh upon each and every heart today as they would view this message, O oh God, this service. We pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit will minister. Lord, we pray for a fresh inspiration. We pray for fresh knowledge. We pray, God, that your Holy Spirit will challenge us and even convict us as, as be necessary so that we will be even drawn closer and closer to you. So bless this service. Bless each and every one, Father. Bless those who need your healing touch today. We continue to lift up the sick to those who are afflicted in body, mind, or even spirit, that your Holy Spirit will minister unto them. We pray, God, that you would raise up those who stand in the need of your divine touch. Raise them up, Father. We pray for healing in their body and health in their bones. We pray you will also continue, continue to comfort those who mourn, Father. Those who love, lost loved ones this past week, be with them, sustain them, help them, we pray. Continue to bless our frontline workers. Continue to bless our leaders, our, our government officials. Lord, as they take, you know, different steps and make different decisions towards uh, overcoming the COVID-19, we pray, God, for your divine wisdom, your divine guidance, your divine favor. We thank you, Lord, that people are understanding the importance of following the necessary guidelines and restrictions. So, Lord, have your way, Lord. Bless each and every one who needs your touch. Continue to be with them today, Lord. And bless this service as we wait before you. May you be glorified, Father. Father, we pray a blessing upon our district church. We pray for Pastor Gaston as he leads the Historia. Spanish church, that you would continue to bless their ministry there in Mississauga. Continue to build your kingdom through them, Lord. 
We pray, God, you bless our district and, and the churches around the globe, that you would be with them and the nations around the globe. And especially nations that are battling and struggling with overcoming this COVID-19. Help them, we pray. Make a way for them. So, Lord, we just thank you today for who you are. Thank you for this time, this summer period, that as we begin to realize that you are bringing us through, that we will continue to trust in you with all our hearts. And lean not our own understanding, but in all our ways acknowledge you and allow you to bless to direct our path, for we ask this in Jesus' name with thanksgiving. Amen and amen. Praise the Lord. We also want to let you know that we will be sharing the Lord's Supper at the end of the message. So I invite you to get your elements in your homes or wherever you are, and you will join with us as we celebrate the Lord's Supper as a community. So may God richly bless you, and may you be inspired in worship as Pastor Mauricio and the team leads us at this time. God bless you.
I praise the Lord. I trust that your hearts were blessed by the worship this morning and also by Roy and Karen as they shared their wonderful gift with us. You know, Spirit Song is such a beautiful message. And I pray indeed that your hearts are in tuned as we are now able to receive and hear God's word. That you would be in that frequency of God's presence. That sensing of God's presence. So I invite you to turn with me to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12 verses 1 to 3 is our text this morning. It's a wonderful passage of scripture. It's a passage that I truly love and have memorized through the years. And just recently, even in our Zoom Bible studies, you know, a couple of Wednesdays ago, someone mentioned that. And I said, you know, that's a message and a passage God has placed on my heart. And I want to share this message with you. I want to challenge you and inspire you to run the race of faith with fresh motivation and hope. You know, all the way we know we are talking about COVID-19 and this pandemic and all of that. But today, I want us to focus, indeed, on the very presence of God that can bring motivation and hope to us in whatever circumstance we are. So reading from Hebrews 12, verses 1 to 3, the writer states, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer, the perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Hallelujah. May God bless the reading of his word to your hearts today. You know, Hebrews is truly a unique book. It's a rich book. It's full of so much. And we were studying that on, on Friday nights, you know, in our TGIF, we call it, Together Growing in Faith. And, you know, we were all challenged. And whether you believe Paul is the writer of the book of Hebrews or not, you know, the key point is the substance that this book gives us. And Hebrews 12, 1 is a wake-up call to see our life as a race and to run it with passion and zeal and energy and discipline. And so I want to speak on the topic, running the race of faith. Running the race of faith. All of us, my friends, should recognize this. Paul himself has likened the Christian life as a journey, as a race. And we are all embarking on this race. And the author to Hebrews wants us to get serious about this race. To test ourselves to see if we are running or coasting or lounging in the couch, you know, or just sitting back. Because I dare say, I'm sure there are some people who, because they're not able to go to church in the building to say, they may have lost some of their zeal or their passion in seeking God. They may have lost their desire to commune and to get connected. And I pray that today as you hear God's word, if you are in that boat, that you would seek, my friends, to be re-engaged, to get excited about running the race of faith, living out your faith. I am thankful for the many of you who come online week after week. We have seen great numbers increase in our Wednesday and Friday night studies and, and those who are viewing online on Sunday. Praise the Lord. But I know there are some who may be not connected and they have to be careful. You see, running can be hard work. And the race can be long, a long you know, way and a, a long journey. And sometimes that journey itself can be difficult. And the road can be treacherous. So how can we finish successfully is a good question. Well, the scripture gives us three motivations in this text that I want to share with you. Because I believe it talks about three types of individuals. The pioneers, the participants, and the perfecter. Think about it. You know? In some ways, I want us to kind of go backwards in these verses. Starting from verse 3 and 2 and then seeking to verse 1. 
Because you see, first of all, the scripture reminds us here in chapter 2 of fixing our eyes on Jesus as the pioneer. But it tells us in verse 1 of chapter 12, the first sentence, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw every, off everything that hinders us and let us run this race. So the first motivation to run is what we note here in verse 1. We are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. And as we run the race, you know, think about it. We are not running alone. It's like the Olympics. You always have a big crowd of people, you know, in the stands. And, and those who sometimes are, are there to watch. And in the same way, I believe the writer is saying here, there's a crowd of saints pressing in, you know, on the track who are there to encourage us. These saints are the heroes of the past that we note in the previous chapter, in Hebrews chapter 11, where we note of all those and other Christians who have run the race and they have finished the race. They are not spectators, but they are there as inspiring examples for you and I. And the Greek word translated witnesses is the origin of the English word martyr. And it means testifiers or witnesses. So the point is that they bear testimony of the power of God in their lives. They bear testimony of their faith to God's, you know, goodness in their lives. They bear testimony of God's faithfulness. And that's why we know that the scripture tells us here in Hebrews 11, it talks about faith in action and it tells us, now faith is the confidence in what we hope for and the assurance about what we do not see. You know, the evidence of things we hope for. This is important to understand. It also tells us that without faith, it is impossible to please God and that God is the reward of those who diligently seek him. So as we read through Hebrews 11, we note about Moses, we note about Joseph, we note about Isaac, we note about Enoch, and on and on. And we praise God for that. Because this motivates us in two ways. First of all, we see that the point of calling of these saints from chapter 11 are as witnesses. And as I said earlier, not so much to say that they are watching us, or just there to observe us, in one sense they do, but to say that they are near enough for us to watch them as well. As we reflect through the Bible and go back through his word, and we look at these biblical characters, we see how they ran the race. We see why they have become pioneers to say, you know, witnesses of what God has done. And they have showed us how we can run the race of faith. <clears throat> but we need to realize that as we look into the crowd and realize that every one of them have finished the race, that we are reminded, hey, if they could do it, we can do it as well. And you know, there are a lot of people who tend to give up in life. There are a lot of people when things get tough, as I mentioned last Sunday, and I spoke about that. That when we are down but we are not out, we realize that there are those who tend to give up when they get knocked down. They don't realize that on the way to success, there are many pitfalls of failure. They don't realize at times, yes, we go through difficulty and we can be knocked down. But as we look at this passage, we are reminded that there are those witnesses, you know, of those who have accomplished things. In most other sporting events, you have people in the stands and in, in, you know, those arenas who haven't accomplished much. They don't have the gifting of the athlete. They don't have the abilities of those who they're watching. And most times they come to watch. But in this case, biblically, we know that these witnesses, they have been where we are. And they've gone further than where we are. Because they are like great spiritual athletes of the past who have completed these events and, and the journey of life and now are eager to encourage the new contestants, the new participants. And they are witnesses 
to God's deeds, witnesses of the power of the Lord that has worked in their lives and can work in our lives. They're witnesses of faith, which only the Holy Spirit can inspire and sustain as we journey together. So, and so we know that then there's this point that these witnesses are there to encourage us. But secondly, we can look at them and see examples of faith and perseverance. Under every imaginable circumstance, uh, we have individuals that we note here from all walks of life. That's one of the things I love. You know, when people say about, oh, you don't know what I've been through or what I'm going through. God doesn't understand. God knows. And we see examples of people who have had worse situations than us. But yet they have persevered. People who came from all walks of life. You know, one of my favorite biblical characters is David. David was a young boy who went through all forms of life. He had great heights, you know. He was a shepherd's boy, but he had a heart for God. And David, you know, went through life with highs when he, you know, struck and killed Goliath. To the point that he became just like a man like any of us. He committed adultery and in sense conspired for murder, killing Bathsheba's husband. You know, he had to run in a sense for his life. And he feigned being, you know, insane when he had to go to Goliath's hometown. David went through all of that. He went through failure and struggles. But yet we know that David finished the race. And we noted that even so, the Bible tells us that David was a man after God's own heart. Think about it. Then we think about another example of a different scenario, situation is John Mark. John Mark was a young Christian like some of us. And John Mark had his struggles when he was first sent to, to accompany Paul. John Mark turned back. And he, in a sense, he became like a quitter. And the Bible tells us that at first Paul didn't want him to go with him. And Barnabas encouraged Paul to take John Mark, who later became a faithful servant of God. You know? You know, and he finished. The race. What about Mary Magdalene? She was a prostitute. But she finished the race. She received the crown of righteousness. Biblical examples. Well, we could think of some others in our world, in our time. You know? Who were men and women. Who honored God in their lives. There was a missionary couple by the name of Russell and Tilly Brunt who served in Trinidad for many years. And another one by the name of Dr. Ruth Saxon. They gave their life in service. They had many struggles. But yet they were motivators who motivated many of us as students at Caribbean Nazarene Theological College, which is now known as Caribbean Nazarene College. But I always was inspired by Reverend Brunt. That man persevered through many trials. As a matter of fact, one time he, he went up into the, the hillside. The Bible College is situated in, on a 30-acre area in Trinidad and Tobago in the Santa Cruz Valley. And, you know, kind of mountainous. And part of the college is built into the mountainside. And we struggled at times with having water for the campus. And we had a spring up there that we would receive water from that would come through the mountains. But we'd always have to go up there and declare it. And one time Reverend Brunt went up there to clear it because trees had fallen after some rain and so on. And heavy thunder showers. And while up there in cutting the branches away, it, he somehow missed and cut his knee right across. And my friends, he didn't just have a basic small cut. The, the, the cut was so severe that his knee literally hang down right there over the kneecap it was broken in two but you know what was amazing no one else was with him and he dragged himself nearly half a mile down through the mountain by the time he reached where we could see him where where we found him when he came down the hill he was so pale they had to rush him to emergency he was never able to walk straight again but he persevered he was an old soldier and he showed us that kind of determination that he always inspired me when I think of him. Today he's up in glory as one of the witnesses in glory. And maybe what about William Carey? 
Some people thought he wouldn't, you know, amount to anything. But I was always impressed with William Carey. William Carey, when you hear his story, you know, a guy who first probably wanted to be a shoemaker, but yet believed that God called him to go out to missions. Who might look, people might have looked at him at that time and think he couldn't achieve anything. But William Carey went forward. And because of his faithfulness, my friends, the modern movement of missions is credited to him. He finished the race. Another good example is Jonathan Edwards, who was kicked out of his church. You know, he finished the race. What about John Wesley? You know, when John Wesley was led of God and the Holy Spirit spoke into his heart, John Wesley decided he was still going to preach and he wanted to preach the message of holiness, of entire sanctification. And when in the Church of England, they didn't want to, to allow him to do this, even when the bishop would tell them, no, Mr. Wesley, John Wesley did not give up. He persevered and he began to preach even on his father's tombstone, it is said. And he finished the race. We know of Job who suffered a lot. He finished the race. Of the Apostle Paul, of course. A great example in the New Testament. So, you know, you could name other witnesses like I have that have inspired you. And maybe you can picture them now. And you can understand the significance of how they ran and, and how they finished. And you recognize that they received the reward of their faith. So as we look at them and we say, well done, and we can say, yes, praise God, God help them to finish. I want you to know that we should be inspired, that likewise to be encouraged, that we too can run this race, race and finish. And that's what we realize. So these are our witnesses, the pioneers of the faith, those who have gone on before us. And my friends, it means then secondly, that we know, knowing that we have these pioneers, are the present participants. We are the present participants. And we need to recognize that as the present participants, we are called to be faithful in running that race. And, and the writer that Hebrews says here, fix in verse 2, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Well, I believe it's so important to realize something. Sometimes when you're running that race, it is not joyful. But yet here, it talks about the joy that is set before us. I believe by far the most overlooked reason for running the race, you know, is having joy. <laughs> People say, that doesn't make sense. I don't take joy in pain. I don't take joy in hardships or tragedy or heartaches. You know, but yet we know it from God's word that you and I can have joy in our spiritual journey, no matter the circumstances. And when we understand that, it gives us a reason to keep persevering. It gives us a reason to keep running this race of faith. Because you know why, my friends? I love the, what the psalmist says. That though weeping may endure for a season, joy will come at in the morning. And I understand how important that is. And that's why the writer is saying we are to endure the cross like Jesus did. And we may scorn its shame. But when we do so for this reason, we will have the joy that was set before Christ. It may be hard now to perceive that. But the point is that it's talking about the goal of our faith. The salvation of our soul. And he's referring to the fact that you and I have that desire to experience the blessing of God. To spend eternity with Christ. And that brings joy to our hearts. And I find joy in knowing that my labor and my efforts are not in vain. So as we look to the promises of God's word, which are laid out before us, in such abundance, you and I can find joy as we journey, even when we're going through difficult times. Even in this season, you can find joy. I mean, the Bible tells us that. One of my favorite verses, John 10, 10 says, Jesus said, I have come that you may have life and have it to the full. And I believe that. I claim that in my life. I claim all that God has in store for me. And I continue to run that race, knowing that God is faithful 
Because in Revelation 2.11, the writer John, the revelator says, Do not be afraid, for I will give you the crown of life. That's what Jesus said to the churches, to those who are faithful. In 1 John 5.15, it says, This is the confidence we have, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. I have joy in knowing that my God will never leave me nor forsake me. I have joy in knowing that when I'm so burdened and when I'm so even down, I can look to God who is my strength and my refuge, who is my fortress. That's why in 2 Timothy 4.18, Paul said to Timothy, the Lord will rescue you from every evil attack and will bring you safely into his heavenly kingdom. You know, that's what the word says. So my friends, we need to realize that as the participants, we have those who are there to cheer us on, to encourage us, to help us to run this race. And we need to know that God is faithful through his Holy Spirit to bless you and I no matter what. And that's why Peter says in 1 Peter 1, 3, 4, in his great mercy, he has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade that is kept in heaven for us. Wow, that brings joy to our hearts. So do not despair. You may say, oh, I don't have joy. Seek the Lord and you will find joy. Seek God and you'll find joy. Dwell in his word and you'll find joy. Let fix your eyes on Jesus as he says here in verse 2 and you will find joy. And just like Isaiah said in Isaiah 35 10, everlasting joy will crown your heads. Gladness and joy will overtake you and sorrow and sighing will flee away. Hallelujah. Yes, you and I have the joy of knowing that. And when we do so, we can understand it. You know, C.S. Lewis was one who put it in one of his sermons. In that sermon, he preached on the weight of glory. He said, if we consider the unblushing promises of reward and the staggering nature of rewards promised in the Gospels, it would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures fooling about fooling about with drink and, and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered to us. Like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. We are far too easily pleased. And therefore, he said, run because of the joy offered you. Because you are destined for greatness. And there is always a prize waiting for you. So, you know, when I think about this here, sometimes, you know, we don't tap in to the full resources of God. We don't realize that. And that's why the Apostle Paul reminds us, forgetting what is behind and straining to what is ahead, let us press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called us heavenward in Christ Jesus. In Philippians 3, verses 13 and 14, Paul said to Timothy in 1 Timothy 6, 12, Timothy, fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you have been called. Paul knew what he was talking about because Paul himself was fighting that fight through the years. And even as he was coming there and after pouring out his life into Timothy and to Titus and to others, Paul could say with assurance and confidence as a true participant and a true pioneer, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. Hallelujah. My friends, there is a crown, a prize, a goal for which we all are striving. And it is nothing less than the eternal joy that we will find, the ultimate joy in the presence of God. But I want you to note, my friends, that even while we are going through this journey of faith, as while we are running this race, we can find joy here, not just when we get to heaven. And we could understand why Paul said, the joy of the Lord is my strength. 
So I challenge you. I challenge you to understand this. And as Paul said in Romans 8, our present sufferings are not even worth comparing the glory which we, it will be revealed in us. So let us continue, my friends, to seek to run this race of faith positively. To seek to understand that we can run this rate, uh, race of faith for we are running for the prize. And that should give us joy and motivation. You know, let me ask you, are you what are you running for? Do you understand why you are Christian? Do you understand why you serve the Lord? Do you have joy in serving the Lord? Do you value the glory that, you know, God, you know, offers to each one of us? You know, do you value God's presence in your life more than anything else in your life? <laughs> I challenge you today that you will be motivated to run this race with such dedication, with such determination. And no matter what you're going through, don't give up. You know, my favorite story is always about Winston Churchill. Whenever I said, don't give up. But, you know, I read something this past week that I didn't pick up in the story, you know. When I always talk about when Winston Churchill was invited to address his alma mater, his own high school. And he went in there and he challenged them to never give up. You know, they said in his speech, he used the word never give up 11 times. And that is credited to what helped, you know, the allies to overcome and the English people to persevere. We need to be mindful of why we are running. And we need to hold on to that crown of righteousness that we seek and desire for. Hold on to Jesus. And then finally, of course, since I said hold on to Jesus, I think the third point here is we have the pioneers. Our witnesses who have demonstrated that they, we can overcome and be victorious. We have the participants and we are called to be the participants who could run today with, with that confidence that we will succeed and we will receive the joy of the Lord. And we could run this race with joy even in, in the midst of obstacles. But let us not forget that we have to resolve to focus on the perfecter, Jesus. Verse 2, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. You know, run the race, my friends. Now, you may conclude that finishing the race indeed depends on us. And sometimes that's what we all think. And I don't want you to get the impression that I'm saying we run this race on our own strengths. No way. A true athlete, yes, has to practice. A true athlete has to, you know, be committed and, and toil through times of, of training and determination. They have to do this. But I want you to note that they cannot always run on their own abilities. And we must never think that God calls us to run this race on our own abilities. Because that's not how it works. We see the scripture tells us, he says, look to Jesus. He is the foundation of our faith from start to finish. He is the one who showed us the example when he endured the cross and endured the shame. You know, he could have called 10,000 angels down when he was there on Golgotha's cross. But Jesus left his home in glory and became a common man to die on the cross for you and I. And we note the scripture tells us that he ran perfectly so that he is now sitting down triumphantly at the right hand of God the Father. And you know, as we think about it, we realize Jesus is not just our example. You know, he is our savior. He's our redeemer. He's our redemption. He's the foundation of our faith. And he's the perfect model of our faith from start to finish. He trusted his father from the beginning. You know, throughout his earthly journey, we would see his dependence upon his, on his, you know, spending time with his father. We know this. 
We know that we challenge the disciples to understand this concept that he had to be in tune with his father. And that's why he said to them, you know, the father and I are one. And he said, what I do, I do for the father's glory. So I want us to understand something, my friends. The God who began a good work in us is the God who is faithful to complete it through Jesus Christ. And Jesus is the author and finisher of our faith. And you and I are challenged that. So don't even begin to think that finishing the race will be dependent upon your strength and your abilities alone. No, my friends. We run in the strength that God supplies. That in everything God may receive glory through Jesus Christ. And that's why we understand this. And that's why Paul says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So if you and I are to finish this race, we are to experience God's perfection in us. And that's why we thank God for his Holy Spirit who comes and cleanses us from sin, who comes and enables you and I to live victoriously. And that's why the writer tells us here, now going back up, as I said, we kind of move backwards from verse 3, 2, and now even verse 1. That we are to throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. If we are to run this race and be perfected in running this race. Every athlete finds out their weaknesses. And their coach will always challenge them to work on their weaknesses. And that's so important. But we need to fix our eyes on Jesus. You know, one of the greatest examples, of course, is Peter and the disciples when they're in the boat. You know, there they were. And Jesus walks out to meet the disciples in their boat in the middle of the lake. And they became terrified because they thought it was a ghost. Remember in those days they would fish during the night time. But then they realized it was Jesus. And Peter decides, Peter says, Lord, if it's you, bid me to come unto thee. You know? And, uh, and we know that Peter walks out. He walks on the water. And can you imagine what faith, you know, he needed to step out of that boat? But that's why I love Peter. He's one of my other favorite characters. When he's good, he's really good. When he was bad, he was really bad. But I loved how Peter stepped out, you know, and he began to take that first step. And we know that he began to walk out. And if you have ever known about the Sea of Galilee, it's not always a calm sea. <laughs> you know, and I'm sure the waves were being tossing the boat to and fro. And it's never easy to walk out of a boat and just walk out so easily when it's on water. I've tried to do that many a times. Never an easy thing. But Peter steps out among those waves and maybe even the wind. And he begins to walk with, to Jesus. But what happens? Peter takes his eyes off Jesus and he begins to sink. <laughs> and now, oh, thank God, Peter was wise. Because at that time, when that began to happen, what does he do? He cries out to Jesus and says, Lord, save me. <laughs> and you know what happened. God reaches and Jesus reaches and takes Peter's hands. And I could imagine the scene with the other disciples. Them and some of them are saying, what was Peter doing? Was, is Peter stupid or foolish? You know, there are always people who are there to discourage us or to tell us other things when we want to step out in faith. When we want to take a leap of faith. I could imagine them. And they try to hold us back at times. And my friends, there are many things that sometimes come in your way that will seek to hinder you. But the Bible says, let us lay aside those things that so easily besets us or so easily hinders us. And we need to do that at times in our lives. Many a times people do not realize this. There are sometimes, you know, I say that just this week as I was sharing with uh, the guys in our session, you know, in the spiritual counseling program that I'm involved in, in with Quinton Warner House and Mission Services here in London. I was sharing with the men that, you know, we have to learn how to resist the devil and resist temptation. And we talked about some of the things that hinders people on the path of sobriety. People, places, things. And I think it's very, very applicable for our spiritual journey as well. 
that we sometimes allow people to hold us back. We allow certain situations and places that are not conducive to be, you know, to, for spiritual growth. We allow ourselves to dwell there. Or we allow things to discourage us. But you know, the Bible tells us that Peter put his eyes on Jesus. He didn't get back in the boat. He didn't try to run back to grab the boat when he began to sink. But he calls on Jesus and he walks in the water. When he learned to keep his eyes fixed firmly on Christ. So I encourage you today to have faith in God. To look to Jesus who perfects all things for us. Who is the perfecter? Who is the example? So that we can be encouraged and we can experience God's blessing. You know. But let us remember what the text is saying to us. We have to lay aside everything that hinders us. And run this race with perseverance. What are the things that hinder you in this life? What are some of the things? You know, a lot of us have secret closets, if we say that. There are a lot of us who on the outside, up front, we look normal. We look perfect. We look as if everything is hunky-dory, as they say. But yet we know we have our struggles. We have those things, those weights, those things that can weigh us down. Those things, those encumbrances to say. You know, those things that can hold us back from running the race and experience God's perfection in our life. Those things that can hinder us from running the race of holiness. We need, my friends, to lay them aside. Whether it be things that we struggle, addictions. A lot of people struggle with addiction. You know, sexual addiction, alcoholic, drug addiction. A lot of people struggle with immorality. It is sad in these times to see how many people seemingly are wasting their lives because they're not willing to get the help they need and get rid of those things that are easily besetting them. So let me ask you as I close, what are the sins that may be hindering you in running this race? Or maybe tangling you up that can cause you to stumble? What is it, my friends? Maybe it's the need to prove yourself and to be thought of well by others. That big word, pride. What it is, you know. Maybe it's the desire for material things instead of spiritual things. What it is. On Wednesday, as we talked in our group, you know, one of the, the guys in the group mentioned the, the, the seven deadly sins. We know that they, they exist. But the scripture is telling us that we need, my friends, to throw off everything that hinders us and the sin that so easily entangles us. I shared with them that verse of scripture that says, abstain the very appearance of evil. We are called to do that. We are called, my friend, to lay aside those things that easily besets us. Look through the scripture. You would see the challenge in scripture for us to learn to surrender our lives completely to God. If you and I are willing to come before God and say, Lord, I surrender all. I give you this area of my life. God is faithful to help us. God is faithful to give us the victory to perfect himself in us through his Holy Spirit. I ask you, have you received the Holy Spirit? Since you believe. Because it is the Holy Spirit who cleanses us. Who sanctifies us. It is the Holy Spirit who dwells in us. And enables us to run this race. With perseverance. To live victoriously. And I pray that you would open your eyes. And look unto Jesus. Because you see when you and I fix our eyes on Jesus. <laughs> we will neither go to the left. Nor to the right. But straight ahead. As someone has rightly said. Not to the left. Nor to the right. But straight ahead. On Jesus. May God help you. To run this race. May you go continue to keep your eyes. On the perfecter. And that you will also now be an example. As a participant. To become a witness. For others. My friends. You and I can continue to keep running 
keeping our eyes on Jesus, and to overcome every obstacle, because blessed are those who overcome, for they will be a pillar in the temple of our Lord. And we can run, you know, with all that we have, even when we face obstacles. In closing, I want you, I'm sure you have remember the story about, you know, Dick and Judy Hoyt, who had a son named Rick. He was born in 1962. And a result of oxygen deprivation in, in Rick's brain at his birth, he became a, a, as I said, a, a spastic quadriplegic with cerebral palsy. Dick and Judy were advised to institutionalize Rick because there was no chance of him, you know, recovering. There was little hope for Rick to live a normal life. And it seemed impossible indeed for them to have that kind of normal life. I mean, an impossible mountain to climb, to think about it. To raise a son who could not walk, who could not talk, who could not eat on his own. I could imagine the discouragement that might have set in to them as parents at that time. But I want you to know, even though their hopes were dash, the life they live, you know, was amazing. Because I'm sure the original plans they had were totally dashed. And they realized that well, this was a race that they wouldn't get up to run. But you know, we know that God ministered in their lives. And when Rick Hoyt was a teenager, he received a computer which enabled him to begin to communicate with his family through head movements. And when he was in high school, Rick learned about a five-mile run to raise money for another child with similar disabilities. He asked his dad if he would run the race with him. Now, Rick's father, Dick, was no runner and had heart trouble himself. But how could he say no? And so we know the story about the Iron Man team. They ran together. Dick pushing Rick's wheelchair every step of the way. You know, the night after that race, Dick remembers and said that Rick told us he just didn't feel handicapped when we were competing. He felt normal. Rick's realization turned into a whole new set of horizons that opened up for him and his family. And we know what has become known as Team Hoyt began. They began to compete in more and more events together. You know, just about continuously, you know, in many different races and even eventually into the marathon races. And what was even more amazing, they competed in a triathlon. That's amazing. A combination of 26.2 miles of running, you know, 11.2 miles of bicycling, and 2.4 miles of swimming. And together, they climbed mountains. They trekked over 3,735 miles across America, North America. Imagine that. For the past 25 years, Nick, who, of course, is Kema Senior, you know, has pushed and pulled his son across the country and over hundreds of lines. It is said that when Dick runs, Rick is in the wheelchair that Dick is pushing. And when Dick cycles, Rick is in the seat pod from his wheelchair attached to the front of the bike. And when Dick swims, Rick is in a small but heavy, you know, kind of attachment. A heavy but firmly stabilized boat that is being pulled by Dick. You can go on YouTube and, and see this video and maybe we'll show you a clip. You know, it's not ours. We don't own it. But it brings that inspiration. And I just love the song that he chose, My Redeemer Lives. You know, a beautiful testimony. And so, my friends, as I close, I encourage you to realize something. When you fix your eyes on Jesus, he will give you all you need to finish this race victoriously. He will perfect things in your life. And as Paul rightly said in Philippians 3, not that I've already obtained this perfection. 
but I press on towards the mark of the high calling in Christ Jesus. And I challenge you today, you know, to realize you have a God who will never leave you nor forsake you. A God who is your refuge and strength. A Savior who died for you. You have the Holy Spirit that can empower you and enable you to be victorious. So because of this, let us run our race each and every day with confidence and with determination. And with the knowledge of knowing that we have the hope that will enable us to be victorious. For we have these witnesses, the pioneers. We are challenged to be great participants. And we have the perfecter who is at work in our lives. Let us pray. And as in you bow your heads with me right now, I know that you know who you are. But God knows who you are even better than you know of yourself. And there are areas in your life where you have to say, Lord, please help me to get rid of the sin that so easily entangles. To lay aside those things, the weight that encumbers. I want you right now to ask the Lord, the Holy Spirit, to minister to your heart and life. How are you running this race? Are you right, running with the right motivation? Are you running with the right reason? Are you running for the joy of the crown that is set before you? I pray that everything you do and say, you do it for the glory of God. So Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit will minister to each and every heart the sound of my voice. I pray God that you would enable us to be like the Apostle Paul, to, to run this race faithfully. That we can say, yes, I have run this race, I have kept the faith. And henceforth is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord our God will give to us. So Father, bless your people. Those who are weak, strengthen them. Those who maybe feel with darkness, Lord, let the light of God shine into their hearts. Those who may be struggling, Oh God, help them to see the way. Those who may be wanting to give up, help them to persevere and to press on towards the mark. Knowing that they're not doing so in their own strength, but by your power and by your Holy Spirit. So bless us, oh Father. May your Spirit minister unto us. For I pray this in Jesus' name. With thanksgiving. Amen. And amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. So may the Lord richly bless you. And as we prepare now to receive of the Lord's Supper, I want to encourage you to experience more and more of God's presence at this time. So I invite you to get your, uh, your elements as we will partake of the body and blood of Christ at this time. You know, the communion supper, which is instituted by our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, as you know, is a sacrament which proclaims his life, his sufferings, his sacrificial death and resurrection, and the hope of his coming again. It shows forth the Lord's death until his return. The supper is a means of grace in which Christ is present by the Spirit. And it is to be received in reverent appreciation and gratefulness of the work of Christ in our hearts and lives. And just as I preached just now, it reminds us of the perfecter, Jesus Christ. And, and it's for all of us who have truly repented and have forsaken our sins and believe on Christ for salvation to come and to draw near. And we are invited to partake of the death and resurrection of Christ. And so we now come to the table that we may be renewed in life and salvation and by faith be made one by the Spirit of God, in the unity with the church, we confess our faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. And that as we pray, that God will bless us. So let us bow together as we bless these emblems of God's broken body and his shed blood. The emblems that you have 
in your homes. And as we partake, we will do so to God our comfort and joy. Let us pray. Holy, Holy Father God, we gather this, your table, in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, who by your Spirit was anointed to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. Lord, we thank you that you healed the sick, you fed the hungry, you ate with sinners, and you established a new covenant for forgiveness of sins. And so, Lord, we, are li we live in the hope of your coming again. Bless these emblems, O oh Father. And as we partake of them, may it bring indeed a sense of new inspiration and blessing and favor. For we pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, the perfecter of our faith. Amen and amen. And so I invite you to get your elements as we take the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ as we reflect on that. And so as Jesus was gathered with his disciples, the night before he was crucified, he took bread and giving thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body which is broken for you. As often as you eat it, it re eat in remembrance that Christ died for you and be thankful. So let us eat together. Likewise, he took the cup and again giving thanks. He said, this is the cup that's symbolic of the new covenant. As often as you drink of it, drink in remembrance that my blood was shed for the remission of your sins and may it preserve you blameless unto everlasting life. Amen. Father, we thank you for this wonderful day, for the opportunity to partake of this holy sacrament. May you continue to bless us all, continue to make us a blessing, and may we be used of you to bring glory and honor to your name as we run this race of faith and overcome. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. God bless each one of you. Thank you for joining us today. Continue to be faithful in seeking the Lord. Join us in our Bible studies. This past week, we were blessed as we shared in the camp meeting on our district virtually. But this coming week on Wednesday and Friday, we're back to our studies on Zoom. You can join us. And we are working towards coming back into the building. We are getting the necessary equipment needed to, for live streaming. Some of the equipment is on back order, so that is delaying us from get, entering the building. But we hope to have everything in place by the end of the month of August and that we can indeed be together again. So God bless you. Email us, contact us if you have any questions. May the grace of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest and abide with you always. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.